everyone, I'm Diana West, Chairperson of the Hadley Historical Commission. And this is not an official meeting, but per open meeting law, since we do have a quorum present, I will do a roll call. If everyone would like to just introduce themselves for our guest, Chris Skelly, that would be fantastic. Uh, I'll just go across my screen. Sherry Parsons. Hi, Chris. Hi, Sherry. Do, do you uh, want me to say more? Uh, whatever you'd like. Oh, I'm a retired history teacher from that I taught at Hopkins Academy. Yeah, actually, if you could say how many years you've been on the commission, I always like to know, like, if you're a newcomer or longtime member. Three years, maybe. Three years, okay. Yeah. Sharon, are you uh, um, a um, longtime resident of Hadley? I've lived here since 87. My husband's lived here all his life. Okay. Uh, Courtney. Hi, um, I have lived in Hadley for about six years and joined the commission three years ago or so. I think it was during, during the pandemic, so. Brianna. Hey, Chris, nice to see you in person after our chat on the phone. Um, I'm Brianna. I have been on the commission for about probably like six months now, not that long at all, um, but it's been great so far. All right. Also, I'm in this really weird conference room because I'm at a hotel and they let me use the conference room. <laughs> so, <laughs> I look really professional in this, in this background. We appreciate that you could make it. Yeah, I'm glad I could make it. Irene? Uh, hi, Chris. I'm Irene Costello. I moved to Hadley just coming up on two years ago, so I'm a newcomer. Um, and I joined the commission at the same time Brianna did about six months ago. Okay. Okay. Right. And Mary, we're just introducing ourselves for Chris and sharing how long we've been on the commission. Okay, sorry, I was a little late. I had to reinstall Zoom for some reason. <laughs> like I haven't used it a hundred times, but uh, Mary Carney, I grew up in Hadley and I moved away for a long time. And I came back maybe four years ago and I've been on the commission, same as Brianna and Irene. So that's it. Thanks for joining us today. Somewhere around six months. We're the newbies. Yeah. All right, that, that's really <laughs> helpful to know. And I don't think I said I joined the commission, I think, at the beginning of 2018. So six years, maybe. All right. Well experienced, then. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I pass the floor over to you, Chris. Okay, great. I'm going to try, try to share screen here. Perfect. <clears throat> All right, everybody can probably see that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we're going to talk about demolition delay bylaws tonight. Uh, so this is a presentation I've done many times over the years. I've made a few changes to it. Um, and as I'll, as I'll mention, I do a consulting work now and, and uh, do lots of things outside, this, outside of Massachusetts. So there's a few things in here that don't necessarily relate just to Massachusetts. They're more for other, other states as well. Uh, we can... We can certainly got to focus our time on Massachusetts. The demolition delay bylaws provide that window of opportunity. You're going to hear me say that a bunch of times, window of opportunity to protect significant historic resources. And my next slide is just a welcome to all of you. Thanks for coming. And I'll do a little introduction of myself here. And uh, I guess we don't have to go through the Hadley Historical Commission introductions because we, we we just did those. <laughs> uh, just, just a little bit about me. So I was at the Massachusetts Historical Commission uh, for 23 years. I was the director of local government programs there. So I worked with all the local historical commissions across the state and the district commission. So that was about 450 commissions. And I'd answer lots of questions, answer lots of phone calls, write guidebooks for you, put together whatever materials might be useful for you. And I did lots of training like this uh, at, at, uh, at MHC as well, regional workshops. So um, now as a consultant, <clears throat> I do the training because I love doing the training. I just really like the 
that that personal connection with the commissions. I miss I miss that a lot from my time at Mass Historical Commission. Um, but I do that not just in Massachusetts. Um, I do that in uh, lots of other states as well. And I do training sessions on uh, basics of historic preservation, benefits of, of historic preservation, uh, local historic districts, uh, Secretary of the Interior Standards, and design guidelines, uh, uh, lots of other lots of other topics that I that I cover, preservation plans, all kinds of things. Uh, and they offer a bunch of other things as a consultant. Um, so that's in in Massachusetts and then other parts as well, mostly mostly northeast kinds of things. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. So that's pretty much what where, where, where my background is. Uh, in terms of demolition delay, uh, while I was at MHC, I did this presentation many, many times. Um, I put together the model bylaw that's for used for demolition delay, uh, and that was uh, based on kind of the best practices around the state on demolition delay. So we'll talk about that bylaw in a little bit too. Uh, and next, I just want to say thank you for serving on your local historical commission. Not always the easiest thing to serve on a local historical commission. So thank you for the hard work that you do there. All right. So some of you are kind of new. So I, I'm just going to go through a few basics on things. It might be too basic for you. If it is, we're just going to go faster. But I, I want to judge. I want to get some 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 of the basics under under underway here. Just just to make sure we're all on the same page. So here we have the John Perkins House in Wenham, Massachusetts, circa 1710. It's listed on the National Register of Historic Places and it was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1990. Uh, and let's say the new owner has decided that the house is a little too small, it's a little too cramped, a bigger house would be better. Can the new owner go ahead and demolish this building on the National Register? Any thoughts, especially from the new people, whether that building can be demolished? I want well, to we say no because it's on the. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Sharon. Have to, we would hope not, but I suspect that it depends upon each town, not necessarily the National Register. All right. That's Sharon's Sharon's idea there. What about. All right. I'm going to call. Brianna was kind of new. Okay. Brianna, what do you think? I think it can be torn down. I, I agree with Sharon that I think it depends on what the town's situation is in terms of the laws they have in place yep okay right. all right anyone else want to mention what offer their thoughts on whether this building can be demolished on the national register i think i agree because i i remember but i don't remember the specifics of saying um what level of protection each of these sort of um designations affords you protection from demolition and I don't think there were very many of them. Okay. Well, you're all on the right track. So, so good for you. <clears throat> this is one of the most important aspects to understand is that this building is not very well protected at all. So it actually was demolished. So a building in 1710 listed on the National oh. Register of Historic Places, it came down in just a few in just a few hours. If you ever had any interest in watching it on YouTube, there's actually a YouTube of this building coming coming down. So uh, particularly sad to see that come down. Uh, well, what about this one, though? Here we have a Baldwin Village uh, historic district. Again, listed on the National Register in 1986. Can this church building, not in very good condition, as you can see, uh, uh, definitely some deterioration on this old 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 church building here. Can this building be demolished? It's in this historic district. It's listed on the National Register. Can it be demolished? It can be. I'll answer this one for you. It can be demolished. And this one was demolished all because of the donuts. It was all because of the donuts. So, yeah. National Register of Historic Places, Historic District, National Register District, it came down and came down quick as well. And it was it is a uh, Duncan drive through right now. So why how can this be possible? It is because 
National Register is actually primarily an honorary designation. So we lose buildings on the National Register all the time, in all the states, all the cities and towns in Massachusetts. National Register is basically an honorary designation. <clears throat> and so I like to say that the great thing about the National Register is that it's an honorary designation. So you have a couple of, you have two National Register districts in Hadley, I think. You have, this, you have four. Is there four? It's, oh, so it's North Hadley, Hadley Center. Um, what are the two other ones? Hockenham. Hockenham, yep. And uh, 40 Acres and its Skirts Districts. So that's the newest one. It's an expansion of the Porter Phelps Huntington House Museum. Oh, okay. Yeah, when the, in the agricultural fields with all the amazing... The amazing uh, way that it was all divided up with the parcels, yeah, yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, so you have you have four thing four four districts right now uh, in Hadley, and one of the great things about the National Register is because it's an honorary designation, there usually isn't too much opposition to being on the National Register. Usually, people once they hear that it's an, it's an honorary designation, they're like, oh, okay, yeah, that's fine. I don't mind being in part of the part of the district because. Uh, it's an honorary designation only. So sometimes things like at the public meeting or something, uh, there might be some concerns, but then once people realize it's an honorary designation, for the most part, um, people uh, are, 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 are not going to have any opposition to being on the National Register. So that's the great thing about the National Register. We can, we can really honor these properties uh, and really recognize them, have them on this nation's list, this National Register, um, and that really has a lot of has a lot of significance in terms of just uh, recognizing recognizing properties. This really carries a lot of weight, so it's a great thing to have the National Register, even though it's honorary. So the other part of the National Register is the not so great thing about the National Register is that it is an honorary designation. So it really goes both ways, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, things come down really quickly with the National Register because it's just an honorary designation. So that leads us to that there are two kinds of historic districts. This is a really important thing to remember, uh, especially the, the new people on the commission to get this, to get this basic concept uh, uh, understood, is that there are two kinds of historic districts. There are national registered districts, like the Heaven Heath, and there are local historic districts like they have in Arlington. And local historic districts are very, very different than National Register districts. It is the local historic districts that actually really can protect historic resources. Um, so my next slide here, just, to, just very, very briefly explains that distinction. National Register districts established by the National Park Service, primarily an honorary designation. Local historic districts established by city council or town meeting. And they're going to be established by through an ordinance or a bylaw in the case of a town. And they are very effective at protecting historic resources. So in a local historic district that's been that's been created by town meeting through the local democratic process, you can actually say, no, you can't demolish that building. You could permanently say that building cannot be demolished. So uh, let's see. Um, Irene, where's a, where's, a, where's a local historic district in the Hadley area? Um, the whole Putting, I, I'm going to put you on the spot occasionally tonight. I hope that's okay. Oh, that's okay. The West Street Common, I know, is one. I don't know if it goes to... Does it go to Middle Street? The whole is it included uh -oh. in the town center? Are you, are you talking about Hadley? And yeah, so it, okay. you asked yeah. that. So, right? so I was I asked, the question was actually where where is a where is a local historic district uh, in the Hadley the Greater Hadley area, a local historic district? I, I think it's well. I know the I we live in one uh, um, on West Street, but it's part of I think that's the center of town. Is the on Middle Street? But if you're talking no. about Hadley, there are no local historic districts in Hadley. There are none. 
They're all the national. They're all national oh. registered districts. Yeah, yeah. not me. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yep. All right. Somebody else want to name a town that has a local historic district? Since Hadley doesn't have any. Northampton. Yeah, Northampton has one. Yep. So right near Smith College, the Elm Street mm -hmm. uh, historic districts. Uh, as you head out of head west out on Route Nine, that's a local historic district there. Any others you can think of? Does Shelburne Falls have one? It does not have one. National okay. Register District here in Shelburne Falls. Yep. Well, Deerfield. Deerfield, yeah. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> Here's a surprise. Hey, don't Deerfield know. is not a local historic district. Wow. Yep. There are no local historic districts in Franklin County. So Deerfield is National Register District. It's it's going to be it's going to show an extra level of protection in Deerfield just because lots of those buildings are going to be owned by either historic Deerfield or have a preservation restriction on them or they're owned by the academy. So it's going to have a much higher level of integrity preservation to it. Um, but that's not because it's a local historic district. There are no local historic districts in Deerfield. Wow. Yep. I know. I, I was wondering. If, I was wondering if, if if someone would mention Deerfield because that usually usually comes up. I think the town I work in, Boylston, has one. I think there yeah, are I think at least they do. signs yeah. that indicate that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You never know from the signs unless it says National Register of Historic Places on the sign, or then you know it's just National Register. Yeah. How about Lexington and Concord? They they must. they definitely they definitely okay. have local historic districts. Yep. Well, Hadley well, may not have a district, but the the town common is protected by town ordinances because I know you can't use the common without getting permission from the select board. But that's the open land, Sherry, not the houses yeah, on yeah, it. Yeah, right. No, that's yeah. what I meant. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So not very well protected in terms of the buildings that are around the common. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. What about Hatfield, Chris? Do they have one? Nope, just National Register okay. in Hatfield as well. Have the eights love to compete with Hatfield, so I have to find out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's good to know. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? The National Register, local historic district distinction there. Okay. So if buildings are not well protected through a National Register district, meaning they're not well protected in Hadley at all because it's just a national registered district. What can you do then? What are your options? Well, I know the historical commission tried to get a historic district passed in Hadley maybe six years ago. Yep. Failed at town meeting. You tried a local historic district back then? I don't remember that, but okay. Uh, I don't know. When I was on the commission, we never got that far. We did present the idea to oh. the select board uh, now three years ago to create the study committee to look into creating a local historic district. Unfortunately, okay. yep. the select board uh, put the kibosh on that very yep. quickly. That's maybe what I'm thinking of. Very All quick. Right. Yeah, that's that sounds that sounds more likely because I don't I don't remember it ever going to town meeting a few years ago. But so yeah, it was probably probably more of the, the appointment of the study committee. So one option you do have is demolition delay. So that's what we're going to head on to, to now. So demolition delay bylaws and ordinances, just like a local historic district, are established by town meeting or city council vote. They're usually for a period of six months, 12 months, 18 months, maybe even more. Uh, they're usually passed as general bylaw, which we'll talk more about that in a little bit. And they're really, I think, I, I consider a demolition delay by a, the real, a real foundation to a local preservation program. It's really, it's the kind of bylaw that every town needs in Massachusetts, which is sort of that, the basic, the basics of how you, how you uh, have a, a, a foundational level of protecting historic resources. Uh, which doesn't to say, isn't to say demolition delay doesn't have some limitations to it. It definitely does have limitations to it. So uh, I I, <clears throat> I would say that demolition delay bylaw is going to offer no guarantee 
that a significant historic resource will be saved? Certainly not. And there's that window of opportunity thing again there. It is a window of opportunity to protect, to, to, to save a historic building, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be saved. So uh, here's what I'm going to try to cover tonight, but I want to say I want this to be a discussion. So um, we're small enough that you can just blurt things out if you want, ask a question, raise your hand if you want to do that uh, on through Zoom. But we're so small that I, I think if you want to just... Uh, Blurt something out and ask a question that way. Um, feel free. Uh, definitely Q and A throughout is going to work best for me. And I really want this. I really want this presentation to be uh, just just what you're looking for. So uh, jump jump in whenever you would like. So here's what I'd like to cover tonight. Uh, we'll see see how that goes. Uh, the one the last one there, proactive tools. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about outreach as well. Just the, the importance of just doing outreach as a proactive tool. So we'll head into that a little bit. Um, I have a like a 90 minute presentation just on community engagement and outreach. Uh, so I'm, I'm not real, I, I won't be able to go into that much detail on it, uh, but we'll we'll touch on the importance of that as well there. Do you mind okay. if we backtrack for one second? Yeah, um, sure. So for the local historic district, um, is it all of the buildings inside the district are protected or just the location? Um, so usually there's a, so there's going to be a map. It all comes down to the map, yeah. Where what the local historic district map says, or, or or where the boundary on the map is, and basically everything within that within that black thick black line of the of the of the map boundary is the local historic district. So uh, it's possible you could have your bylaw written so that some things are exempt in there. I have okay. seen that it's it, it comes up sometimes. Sometimes I've seen some bylaws that say if it was built after 1960 or something, then it's exempt from 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 local historic district review. Okay. Uh, some have had things like if it's a municipal e owned property, it's exempt from review, things like that. But for the most part, if it's if it's in the local historic district, oh, and I should point I got I should meant, I point this out as well, and it's visible from the public way, then it's reviewable. So if 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 it's even if it's within that. If it's what's in that boundary, but you can't see it from the public way, um, then it's it's there's no review. I mean, it's there's no there's no uh, obviously there's nothing on the interior of a building that could ever get reviewed because that's not visible from the public way. If it's on the rear of a building, uh, it's not it's not reviewable. It's really it's local historic districts exist uh, constitutionally because they're there for the public welfare and the way that's done is recognizing that there's a there's a there's a public benefit to having our historic resources remain part of our communities and there's a big supreme court case on this back in the 1970s that's still cited in other land use zoning kinds of cases uh, and basically that talked about uh, the public benefit of of, of having uh, historic resources still present in our communities, but it really is just what's visible from the public way. Okay. Thank you. Sure. All right. So let's jump in on how it, how does a demolition delay bylaw work? Um, so here's our state law, statewide map of demolition delay bylaws and ordinances. This is just a little bit out of date. Um, but not not too much. We're probably up to about 160 right now is what I what I understand. There's going to be a few more towns that are on this map, but you get a sense of pretty much where the where the demolition delay bylaws and ordinances are in the state. So you can see they kind of come up into the valley a little bit, but it's definitely more of an eastern mass um, um, local law. So here's how most of them work in Massachusetts, uh, typical steps that would be followed in a, under a bylaw. <laughs> the applicant's gonna go to town hall to file the application to obtain the building or demolition permit. And the building inspector is gonna note whether that building is subject to the demolition delay bylaw. If it is, the building inspector is gonna forward that application to the local historical commission. 
And then the historical commission is going to make a determination that the building is significant. Or, of course, they might say it's not significant, and then the process ends from there. <laughs> After that, the historical commission is going to schedule a public hearing. And they're going to take comment from the owner, abutters, whoever else would like to speak. And following the end of the public hearing, the historical commission is going to make a determination uh, on whether the building is preferably preserved. That's a common terminology, preferably, preferably preserved. Uh, and if it's found preferably preserved, then the applicant cannot demolish that building during the delay period. And it's going to be either the six months, 12 months, 18, whatever it is. And the idea is that during that delay period, there's alternatives that, that are considered, investigated, considered. We'll talk about some of those examples later. Uh, but the idea is that some, some other scenarios can come, come, come forward besides the demolition of this building that's been there for 200 years or whatever. At the end of that delay, though, so after that delay has expired, the building can be demolished. So long as, all, of course, all the other permits are needed, uh, the, all, the, all the other permits that were needed are obtained. So there's usually an application process. So somebody uh, is going to that wants to demolish a building is going to fill out an application and submit that to the historical commission. So the historical commission might also require some photographs, uh, other kinds of items, just to get a sense of what's what's going to be required. Sometimes there's a small fee in terms of submitting that application, um, but usually it's pretty pretty simple process to fill out that application, and that's how you get a sense of. Uh, how you're gonna how you're going to review this project and uh, decide whether it is preferably preserved or not. It, is demolition only total demolition or any sort of change to the visible part of the structure? Yeah, that's a great question. And hang on a few more slides. We'll definitely okay. get to <laughs> very good, very good question. Uh, okay, so this is a good thing to think about just in terms of how most of these work. So that application goes to the building inspector, to the historical commission, the determination of significance, your public hearing, determination of preferably preserved, and then if it is found preferably preserved, the delay. The, the better bylaws in Massachusetts, I would say, have this two-step process where you're deciding very, very quickly within a matter of days you know, like 48 hours or something uh, that maybe the chairperson even has this is delegated to make this decision uh, on whether something is significant. And that's a great way to do this because that way, if it's not significant, if it's clearly not significant, there's no hold up at all. It just, it goes right. It goes, it goes forward and the building can be demolished uh, with the, with the proper building departments uh, permitting after that. It's really that next step in terms of determining whether something is preferably preserved. And I, I can think of times where maybe something is found significant by the commission, but it's not found preferably preserved. Because significance is significance and preferable preserved are two different things. Significance is, yeah, it meets certain criteria that the building is significant, historically significant, architecturally significant. Preferably preserved takes into a lot of other things. It might even take into account the condition of the building, right? I mean, this, can, this gets misused sometimes, but there are certainly buildings that are so far, uh, so badly decayed that they cannot be rehabbed, um, but they might still be significant. it could be some very, very significant buildings, but in the end, the building is so far gone that it can't be it can't there's no there's no reasonable likelihood that this building will ever be uh rehabbed and that's why you might want to find it not preferably preserved at that point so why do you have to be careful about the, sorry where does the yep. public hearing fit into that because that that seems kind of onerous in this process if it's supposed to be um you know pretty quick did, uh, did you say a few days not for the public hearing usually that's going to be that's like, likely, likely to be at least a couple of weeks for the public hearing. 
so yeah, there is there is there is there is a process there where where it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna delay the delay a demolition uh, just to go to the public hearing for at least a few weeks. And it depends on your scheduling. I mean, what's it's, I mean, commissions. Some commissions meet twice a month, and they can get things on to the agenda pretty quickly. Lots of commissions only meet once a month, so it's going to go on to the next the next agenda. All right. Here's your 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 our discussion on whether what exactly is a demolition anyway. This is language that's often in demolition delay bylaws. Uh, you can read that and still be kind of wondering. Well, I don't know what a demolition is. Uh, so yeah, I think I think the, the 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 definition in a lot of the bylaws still leaves lots of room for what what does that mean? So I'm going to ask you a couple questions here. Is this a demolition? Probably all agree that this would be a demolition here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is this a demolition, though? If that's as far as it goes, the roof is gone, all the sheathing is gone. Is this a demolition? Doesn't it depend on your bylaw? Yes, yes. That's, that's, that's pretty much the correct answer, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but let's go a little further with this, though. Is this a demolition, the removal of windows? Let's go even further. The removal of architectural trim, the application of vinyl siding, are these a demolition? Also dependent on the bylaw, correct? And what you include? Yeah. yeah. You are exactly right, yes. <laughs> so there are, there are some bylaws in Massachusetts that say, if you cover the majority of the building with vinyl siding, that is considered a demolition. If you remove architectural trim, if you remove a window, that is considered demolition. It's going to be what that, how it's defined within the bylaw that's been passed by town meeting. To me, I, 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 I think it's still it, 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 sort of the public eye here. Uh, I, I think uh, it's questionable whether covering a building with vinyl siding would really be considered a demolition, and. I think it's best to really have a, de a definition of demolition in your bylaw that the commission, the general public, anyone can really recognize. Yeah, that's that's definitely a demolition taking place there. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's up to how the bylaw is written itself. Uh, sometimes, uh, just to make it a little bit clearer, there might be words like this: removing a roof removing an exterior wall, removing 25% of the building, uh, that some percentages there can really help in terms of giving some clear numeric guidance on what actually constitutes a demolition. Uh, this can be challenging sometimes, just it's, if, if you said, um, like who's ready to say that it's 24% or 26% of a dem of a, of the building is being removed. It's a little, can get a little challenging in there. Uh, it could, I, I haven't actually heard of it happening, but it, it, I could see where it, see where that's possible. But uh, I actually haven't heard it come up like that. Uh, so I, I do think I, I actually do really encourage that idea of some real numeric uh, definition there so that it's really clear uh, when it when it goes over the when it goes over the line of of uh, being a demolition, and is that twenty five percent of what's visible or the whole building? That would be the whole building. Yeah, yeah, not just what's visible. All right, I'm going to jump forward to types of demolition delay, and there's three different kinds: age. <laughs> age categorical and list based age based bylaws are really the ones that are right for basically every city and town in Massachusetts basically means uh, everything that's over 50 years old or maybe over 75 years old or maybe something everything be built before 1930 <laughs> that there's some sort of age that's the that's the tripping mechanism um, usually this is based on what the assessor records say, which assessor records are sort of notoriously um, 
bad at, at, at dates. Um, but usually for if it's, if it's, if it's usually it's more like the sets of records are off by, uh, if they might say it's a hundred years old, but it's really 150 years old, that, that kind of thing. Um, so usually a sets of records are going to give you a good enough sense on whether it trips, it trips the bylaw in the, in this case. Uh, so this is kind of this. This is what I think is best for both for for most cities and towns because it really covers everything. It's a it's a it's a comprehensive way of of uh, making sure that what might be significant historic resources is going to be covered by the bylaw. And as long as you have that two step process there of whether determining whether something's significant and then preferably preserved, the things that are not significant, if it's not if even if it's even if it's 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 meets the age criteria, but you've decided that it's not a significant property, then there's no holdup. It goes it goes forward very quickly uh, in terms of uh, moving forward through the through whatever permitting they're needing uh, to do the demolition. So maybe it's a garage or something. Uh, it's just not it's not rising to the level of significance. You can sign off quickly, and the demolition permit moves forward really fast after that. The other kind of file up that's there is categorical. And this means what's subject to the demolition delay bylaw <clears throat> is in some kind of category. So maybe there's one of those forms there. I hope everyone's familiar with the form B's. Uh, the Massachusetts, uh, the inventory properties, the inventory forms there. <clears throat> so if there's one of those forms that's been filled out and submitted to the Massachusetts Cultural Resource Information System, or maybe it's buildings that are on the National Register of Historic Places. These are the buildings that are going to be subject to the bylaw because they meet one of these categories. Here's what I think of this kind of bylaw. <laughs> I would I would discourage you from having this bylaw. I think there's a lot of problems with them. Uh, I I I I I. I uh, I've recognized over the years that they just they just don't work as well as they should, and they cause lots of problems. Uh, I just told you earlier, over and over again, National Register is an honorary destination. National Register of Historic Places is an honorary destination. You heard me say that a bunch of times. Well, it's honorary unless you at the local level pass something at town meeting that says it's no longer honorary. And that just confuses everyone. Um, so we like to be able to say the National Register of Historic Places is an honorary designation. Uh, but when it's decided that uh, through a local bylaw that it now now that now that listing on the National Register has some sort of additional protection, uh, that's that's problematic. When it's done with the forms, those form B's, which are really just a way to identify and document historic resources, there isn't like a statement of significance by being on one of those forms. Not, not none whatsoever, actually. That's a problem as well because it makes it sound like, oh, it must be a significant property if it has one of those form Bs. It's not. It's it's uh it it it, it, it doesn't. That's not what those form Bs mean at all. Uh, so I would discourage you from this one, obviously. And then there's this kind, list based. And that means that it, there's a street address list maintained by somebody, usually the historical commission. And if it's subject to the demolition delay bylaw, it's going to be on this list. So that means over the past years, you've gone out and done a really comprehensive look at kinds of at the properties that should be uh, subject to the demolition delay bylaw, and you've prepared a street address list that covers them. This might work in some communities. Uh, it has some real advantage, advantages because it's it's great for everyone. They can quickly look at this. It's great for you as the commission. It's great for the building department, the inspectors that's uh, issuing the de demolition permits. It's great for property owners. Everyone can look at this list and immediately know whether they're subject to the demolition delay bylaw. That's the great thing. The downside is that it's really easy to miss things. And so this is for one town one town that does have a, a, a list-based uh, bylaw, but they missed a lot of things on that list. And watch this. 
Mm. All those got demolished in that town because they weren't on that list. Um, they just weren't, they weren't comprehensive enough when they put it together. So I, I, I could see some benefits here, but I, I think the age best, the age based one is the best one to, to go for. So that length of the delay period uh, back in the 1980s, early 90s, when demolition delay was really getting going, everybody only did six months. That was the longest delay periods that, that existed out there. So uh, that means nowadays, most of the bylaws are still six months because they were passed in the 80s or 90s. But the trend is really actually to go this way. The trend is to either pass a much uh, longer delay period or to switch your six month demolition delay bylaw to a 12 or an 18 month. So this is this is clearly what the trend is, uh, just because six months wasn't really giving enough time to really find some opportunities to make to some possibilities for another scenario. And 12 or 18 or 24 really gives you some more options for how best to protect a building that's been there for 200 years. So Milton and Watertown passed a 24-month demolition delay bylaw. What do you think, Hadley? 36 months? Could you be in Hadley be the first town that would pass a 36-month demolition delay bylaw? No. What, what was that? No way. No way. Not that. No way. No. Wouldn't happen. No. No, no way. We'd be run out of town on rail. <laughs> but also, yeah. things move so slowly. <laughs> yes. That we might we say eighteen months, twenty-four months, and well, it'll be thirty-six months at the end. <laughs> yeah. So it'll be interesting to see if somebody does go more than twenty-four months in the next few years. 24 is the, the highest that we're at in Massachusetts. But if you went to some other states, you would see ones that are more like 36 in places. So, yeah, something to aspire to. But I, I, I kind of was I was imagining that that was going to be your reaction. Like, no way could we do 36 months. All right. I'm going to give you some success stories with demolition delay. Uh, and I'll start off with ones that, again, you're just like our last slide there, you're probably going to say, yeah, well, that's not going to work here in Hadley, but I'm just going to give you some examples and you'll get us, you've got a sense of some possibilities, uh, whether they, whether you can relate and go, yeah, that wouldn't work here uh, or, or not. But we'll, we'll start off with some of the more, we'll start off with the more complex ones, I guess, first. All right. So <laughs> we talked earlier about local historic districts and in a local historic district, pass through town meeting, you have the ability to permanently prevent demolition from taking place. So demolition delay, just a delay. You've got that, that window of opportunity there. Once it's a local historic district, the town has the ability to say, no, that building cannot be demolished. And that's, 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 that's a permanent decision. You can't, you can't demolish the building. So in Massachusetts, you can do... <laughs> When you create local historic districts in Massachusetts, you can do multi-property local historic districts. You can also do single building local historic districts. And so back in 2019, the town of Hopkinton established a single building local historic district during the six month demolition delay. That meant that when the six month demolition delay expired, it was in a local historic district. And that meant it was permanently, permanently protected by being in a local historic district. Yeah. In this case, the owner, not very happy with that decision, see this building uh, included as a local historic district. Uh, there was a date plaque, a little sign that had the date, historic date on the side of the building. As a former protest, he painted over the date plaque sign. When he bought the house, 
Uh, after, 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 after it became a local historic district. Yep. That'll show them. <laughs> yeah. This one as well. So this one, this one was uh, established as a single building local historic district in Springfield. Uh, so this is going to be a parking lot. Oh. Uh, and uh, went under demolition delay. Uh, and really fascinating story. I mean, this is there was a gas leak explosion a few years ago. I don't know if you remember that. <clears throat> uh, this building was pretty badly damaged in that gas explosion and uh, was vacant after that. Uh, so, it was, yeah, it was going to come down as a, par a parking lot. And uh, uh, went under demolition delay. And the city of of Springfield established a local historic district here. And this building has now been rehabbed and uh, apartments apartments now. So a new owner came in, got tax credits, uh, <laughs> did a complete uh, uh, rehab of the property. Uh, it's occupied now, a really amazing success story. What made it so valuable to save it with words? Well, yes, it's a great question. Yeah, yeah. Part, partly um, the city recognized this building is really important in terms of their their uh, downtown revitalization strategy. This this building was actually recognized in some of their planning uh, planning documents in terms of being a key property. It's not that far from the train station, and just in terms of how how they could they could get that area of Springfield going again. This building was pretty key. So that's one of the things, reasons I think that city council was really supportive of, of making sure this building uh, remained, um, you know, uh, in creating just a single building local historic district certainly wasn't going to be enough. Uh, it needed the tax credits to be able to really make sure this building was going to get rehabbed. So um, just the, just the, just, just the local historic district, it would still be, it would still be vacant otherwise. So you can do single building local historic districts during the delay period. <clears throat> you can also do large local historic districts during the delay period. And that's what happened in Reading about 10 years ago. So they only had a six month demolition delay in Reading. Uh, and there was one building upper left there that was proposed for demolition. And uh, neighbors really rallied uh, around uh, making sure that building was going to be saved. Um, so if you went down that street around that time of that demolition delay, you'd see signs that look like this. You'd see more signs. Basically, every house had a sign about saving this building. And that's kind of what it took. So it was just this real grassroots uh, constituency that really wanted a local historic district on their street. So they did something that had really been unheard of up until at that point, because it's it's a lot of steps to establish a local historic district. It's a little bit quicker in Reading than it would be in Hadley, just because they already had a local historic district there. So they didn't actually have to go through that study committee that you had to go through for the select board. They already had, they didn't have, they could, they could skip that, that step. So this is how that whole timeline went. When the delay started, that's when it was going to end. So they submitted that study report. There's MHC presentation, public hearing, passed a town meeting in November, approved by the Attorney General. Map was recorded at the Registry of Deeds on January 9th. And that was it. Local historic was official. So no demolition was allowed at that point. So first time I'd ever seen anything like that happen that quickly. Oh, this has always been one of my favorite stories <laughs> where this, this building in Reading got moved. Um, so this building came up under demolition delay and really early property in Reading, really significant. Uh, so the town with the, the commission really wanted to make sure it got saved. So what they did was they found a piece of property <clears throat> that was owned by the water department. And they carved off a little piece of water department property, moved it onto that site, and then sold it through an RFP process uh, for the new owner to come in, rehab it, restore it, uh, and uh, have a preservation restriction placed on it after that. So a huge success story here, uh, really neat property. 
And a key part of moving a historic building under demolition delay, because I have some other examples of this too, this building was moved intact. That's not ideal. I mean, it loses its context. It loses where that building has sat for the past 300 years. But it did get moved intact. It got put, the whole thing got put on a trailer and put back down again. <laughs> when a building gets taken apart, disassembled piece by piece by piece by piece, a lot of that building ends up in the dumpster. So you can save, you can save some of it and reassemble it somewhere else. It could be California, it could be Alaska, uh, could be a different state, that happens too. But so much of that building gets lost that I don't consider that a historic preservation save. <laughs> I mean, it's a solid waste save, a lot more, a lot less material went into the landfill. And it's better than nothing, I suppose. Uh, but when a building gets disassembled, too much gets lost. So I don't I don't consider that a preservation success story. But moving it intact, it's still that still goes into my book for a, a, a great, a great success story in the end. Was this one as well? question yeah, about sure. that? Was that so actually oh, go ahead. right now? I was just going to say, Diana, working, you should touch on that. Yeah. So we are working with somebody who has bought a property that has an 1840 house on it. And we want to save the house. And so we have brought up the idea of having the house moved. So with the situation in Reading, who actually owned the house when they moved it? I'm, yeah, that's a great. Uh, I'm pretty sure that new owner was already decided. I think the owner, the, yeah, the new owner had to actually pay for the for the moving part. Okay. They got that, so they got they got a great deal on the the parcel of land. Mm -hmm. uh, but they did they were responsible for the move. Okay, and so then when you said they put out an RFP, so does that mean that the, the previous owner was selling the house in that moment to whoever? bid on the RFP and was awarded it and then they had control over the house or the new, the person who moved it still had control over the house? It was actually going to be a parking lot. So I think it was on a golf course. So it's going to go to a parking lot. So there wasn't, there wasn't going to be a new house built. I think the no, golf I mean the existing it. house. So the existing house was moved. The person yep. who moved it owned the house, but then they went through that RFP process you mentioned. So did the RFP process also sell the house to a new person? Uh, the town was involved because the, the the parcel of land that it went to was town owned. So it wasn't just a private transaction here. The town was very much involved, but more with the land itself. So this, this parcel of land got carved out from the water department and by placing it on that, the town was doing the RFP that you get this lot as long as you move the house there and agree to the terms. Okay, so the RFP happened before they even moved the house. So the person yeah, who... Yeah, that was all set. Yep. Okay. Yep. All right. I think I'm understanding the process now. So the person bid on the RFP, then they moved the house, and then it was yeah. their house on the, that piece of property at that point. Yep. Okay. Yep. And Thank were you. there... Um, it looks like they had to do some renovations to the house. Were there any restrictions against new windows and it looks like a new roof and yes, definitely. Yeah. There was all kinds of, there's uh there's actually restrictions right in the deed, a preservation restriction to, to, to uh, per permanently protect this house. So they couldn't, when they, after the house was moved to its new location, they could not renovate or update the house. Uh, they could, but that was all part of the part of the agreement on what was going to be allowed in terms of that rehabilitation. Okay. I'm loving the up for adoption sign because we've we've had many meetings now with the owners of the house that Diana was referring to and trying to figure out like how to get someone. Basically, he's offering the house for free. He's saying nobody even has to buy the house. I will give it away if someone will pay the moving costs, mm -hmm. and so basically we have this free house and we're trying to figure out how to get someone excited enough about this house, which has been actually renovated on the inside, like in a pretty extreme fashion. And um, also very recently, but it is still, it still has a lot of its historic features. So we've been trying to figure out who can take this house. So <laughs> I don't know if that's like a, something you guys are all um, looking at as well. Like maybe we could post something up for adoption <laughs> about 
about the house that we've been dealing with as well. Cause I think that's a cute way to phrase it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Like this next one here, uh, this one got moved as well in, in East Ham. This really happened because it was in the newspaper. So this is entirely private. Building was getting moved. It goes into the newspaper. There's publicity about it. Uh, somebody that owns some property like half a mile down the street said, I, I could move that house onto this, this vacant parcel of land that I have. And they worked that out and it moves down the road, down right down route six uh, onto an, onto a new parcel uh, and uh, was, was rehabbed there. So uh, all, all happened only because there was publicity there through the newspaper. Mm hmm Yeah, this one's a really neat one too. This was a midwife's house, so lots of people in East Ham were <clears throat> were born here. Um, so it had a lot of a lot of significance to the town of East Ham. Uh, sometimes uh, demolition delay just results in transfer of ownership. Uh, owner. Go start the demolition delay process starts and the owner says, I don't want to, I don't want to have to go through the delay or this isn't what I want to, I, I, I don't want to have to uh, wait to do this demolition. I'm going to choose something else. I'm going to choose the town next door that doesn't have demolition delay. Something like that. Uh, so uh, these are a couple of examples where it goes on a demolition delay and then the new owner, it goes on a demolition delay property goes on the market and then the new owner uh, rehabs the building instead. Uh, this one as well, transfer of ownership, this building uh, is really unique. I mean, this, this takes a third, a very, a very unique uh, owner that's interested in these houses. This is a Lustrin house. <clears throat> what we are all going to be living in post-World War II. So these are uh, these baked enamel uh, all metal, all metal houses. Uh, really, it's it's, just, it's like it, it all arrives in a truck. It's you bolt the whole thing together, interior, exterior, and uh, this is going to be the future of of uh, suburban living. Um, <laughs> there's still few, some of these around. Um, I'm I'm just I'm fascinated by them. I've never been inside one, but I'm fascinated by them. Uh, in this case, the building was going to be demolished for a much bigger house, <laughs> and. Uh, Went under demolition delay, property went back on the market, and new owner just really enjoyed Lustrin houses as well, and uh, purchased it and and uh, and you know loved their loved their very historic unique house. There's another one from Reading, uh, where they worked with the conservation commission. Uh, this was a for a small subdivision that was taking place adjacent to this building. And uh, the building was proposed for demolition to allow the subdivision to take place. Um, by working with the Conservation Commission, they got a little bit of relief in terms of the Wetland Protection Act. And uh, that allowed the subdivision to take place, but allowed this really early property, early 1700s house, to remain in place. Um, so that was just kind of like working with another board to try to figure out some sort of compromise. This was a huge complex in Easton. <clears throat> uh, the whole thing was going to be proposed for demolition. Shovel shops. Uh, I mean, everything was going to be leveled here. Uh, and uh, went into demolition delay. And uh, they were they were successful in figuring out a way to get this whole thing rehabbed. Uh, took a lot of Community Preservation Act funds as well. Uh, but uh, really amazing success story here. Another really interesting story here is in Boston. Uh, it's one of the earliest buildings in the city of Boston within the city limits. This old farmhouse, basically the neighborhood completely grew up around this, this farmhouse. And this farmhouse ended up being on this little side street, kind of forgotten. Until it went under demolition delay. And everybody's like, wow, that's amazing. And uh, uh, it was really recognized as just how significant it was as, as such an early property in the city. Uh, and the nonprofit for Boston uh, took it on and uh, 
rehabilitated it and uh, it's an urban garden, urban farming institute now. A real amazing success story here uh, that this, that in this really inner city neighborhood, dense, dense neighborhood where this building was just completely lost. Uh, it, it just this, this, this gem in terms of uh, now, now an urban, urban gardening in, institute. We hear this a lot in terms of uh, this building right here. Get letters like this signed by an engineer. This construction currently does not meet the requirements of the Massachusetts State Building Code, uh, suggesting somehow that the building needs to be demolished because it doesn't meet the building code. Just ridiculous, of course, because nothing in this world that's built right now meets the current state building code. Uh, so Cambridge, of course, had the the uh staff there to be able to recognize that didn't make any sense and uh property went back in the market new owner new owner new owner rehabilitated the property uh and uh it it was fully occupied as a as a residential unit after that another story here in terms of Worcester uh this building was going to come down for a parking lot uh, but somebody recognized, a potential buyer recognized that the adjacent building that wanted the parking lot could still get their parking lot if the property was subdivided or was uh, if the if the lot line between the the medical building and this building uh, was just changed a little bit, and so that was worked out between these two adjacent owners. Uh, they got their larger parking lot, and this house has a smaller lot size now, but still an adequate, adequate lot size. And the building was able to be saved that way. So um, a win-win solution for both, both the medical office building and the new property owner here, uh, entirely a private transaction that took place, but uh, facilitated because of demolition delay. Weston's had some successes with the Community Preservation Act and uh, requiring a preservation restriction after that. So uh, basically having some Community Preservation Act funds available uh, so long as a preservation restriction is placed on the property. I'll talk more about that if you'd like, but this is an interesting, interesting, unique idea. We've, We've had success with yeah. that as well. I was going to say, Diana, <laughs> same thing, talking about the, the church in town right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so recently in the past couple of years, uh, the North Hadley Village Hall was a town owned oh, yeah. building that they um, sold to private owners. And so they applied. Uh, part of that sale was that a preservation restriction had to go on the building. And they also, I think, provide applied for CPA funding. And so the CPA committee is really the ones who make that requirement that if they're using um, tax funded tax funds, then there needs to be the preservation restriction on the building. And most recently, we did that with a former church in town. It was the St. John's Church, but now it's owned by V1 Vodka. And he would like to do some uh, preservation to the exterior of the building. And so that was approved um, for CPA funds with the stipulation that it would have a preservation restriction put on it. All right, good. Um, <laughs> Diane, did you have any time limit for me? Do you want me to? Go faster. Um, how, how are we doing for time? Um, I think we're at about the hour mark. So I think we had set out a, probably about an hour and fifteen minutes overall. Okay. Um, so okay. I don't know how much okay. how much more how many more slides you have, but I, I can I can go a little faster and we'll we'll go from there. Okay. Thank you. So some more successes here. Uh, top one it's supposed to be a chain drugstore. Uh, if you can believe it, that was new owner came in. Uh, rehab that mixed use residential units above uh, bottom one building was going to be a part of a small subdivision, just a three lot subdivision. That building was on the lot line. So it's going to have to come down because it was on the lot line. Instead, the developer said, okay, well, I will, I will move that building a little bit so that it's off the lot line built his two other houses next to it. So he still sold three houses in the end, which is what he wanted to do. But the historic building was able to to remain that way. Uh, okay, just 
sometimes demolition delay gets used in terms of just some design review, trying to come up with a better design, <laughs> sort of a negotiation. So they came up with uh, a, a better, that was the old garage. They wanted a new garage. The new design was not very appropriate. Um, so they, in the end, they came up with this design here and they waived the delay that way. They said, if you just, if you give me, if you give us a really good design for this garage, you, we're not going to delay. We're not going to find it preferably preserved. We're going to lift the delay in this case. Uh, that's another thing that's done with demolition delay in a few, a few places more just right around, especially around Boston. I used to get asked this all the time. Uh, how many buildings get saved? And it was really an impossible way to impossible question um, because I really feel like success has happened even when the application is never even filed. It's just that just having demolition delay on the books makes a difference. People recognize that oh, there's demolition delay here. This is probably going to be fine, found properly preserved. I'm not going to go through the process here. So lots of success with demolition delay. Um, but no guarantee that a building will be saved. This one right here came down pretty much the next day. As soon as the delay expired, building came down. <laughs> uh, you might have heard th might have heard things like this. I certainly have. Uh, and while there might be truth to that, demolition delay does what it's supposed to do. It gives you that window of opportunity. And that's it, really. It's a window of opportunity for a different scenario to come about, but no guarantees. All right, tips for passage of a demolition delay bylaw. <laughs> All right, don't feel too bad. Even that building in Wenham, 1710, that was demolished. Even that building in Wenham that was taken down after that, Wenham still didn't pass demolition delay. Wenham's still doesn't have demolition delay at this point. So don't feel too bad in health if you don't have demolition delay yet. Here's an important piece of advice in terms of demolition delay. <laughs> stick with the basics and don't worry about demolition delay. Stick with stick with stick with the, the basics of what you do in terms of a local historical commission. And just just keep working at that. You know, things like survey and community outreach, national register. Uh, sometimes it's better just to, to think on 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 doing these on doing these kinds of things, whether it's low hanging fruit kinds of things. Just keep doing these things. Um, if you're if if demolition delay isn't a reality, I'm really into big I'm really big into just accepting realities when it comes to uh, uh, local local historical commission activities. If demolition delay isn't a reality at this point, uh, just keep doing just keep doing these other things. Um, but if you want to keep going with demolition delay, here's some other tips to think about uh, for what has worked for some other towns. Uh, do some research in terms of how many buildings this would actually have impacted. If you had had demolition delay over, the, say, the past five years, how many buildings would have actually been impacted? How many buildings probably would have been found preferably preserved under the bylaw? Chances are for a town the size of Hadley, it wouldn't have been very much. If you were Wellesley, Newton, yeah, those numbers are going to be really high. Um, but in Hadley, it's probably going to be pretty low. And that really helps to recognize, for everyone to recognize in the public, well, this really doesn't affect that many properties in the end. <laughs> Another thing that some towns have done is actually publicize what's been lost over the years. They put together something maybe at old home days, um, <laughs> maybe a newspaper article or something, something to just recognize that these are all the buildings that were lost because we didn't have demolition delay. That can be pretty telling when you see when you see that really uh, when you when you really see all those photographs and recognize just what's come down. Uh, it 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 could be very telling. Oh, the importance of just really meetings and communication. Uh, so you said you went to the select board a few years ago to talk about the local historic district. Uh, one thing that I really recommend is that you go to the select board at least once a year, whether you're talking about demolition delay, local historic districts or not. Um, so this is like Leesburg, Virginia over here. They actually put together an annual report that they bring to their city council once a year. They they bring to, they go to the city council and say here's what we accomplished over the past year, 
Here's what our goals are. And so they're not going in with any kind of an agenda on what they want from their local elected officials. They just say, this is, this is, this is everything that we've accomplished there in, in their annual report. That could be a great thing to do with your select board, get on their agenda once a year or something uh, to tuck up to. So just so that you're, 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 you're recognized as, uh, as what you're accomplishing. Uh, of course, it's definitely really important to be thinking about uh, meeting with lots of local local elect, uh, officials in terms of if you are pursuing a demolition delay at that point. Main one is going to be your building inspector. So you really want to make sure you want to talk to. You want to have a really good relationship with your building inspector. Because um, building inspectors have a lot of power and they're not always necessarily supportive of historic resources. So I've, I've gone to some building inspector meetings over the years and I was a little shocked by what I heard sometimes. <laughs> uh, so you really want to be able to sit down with your building inspector, talk about what's in the bylaw, how it's going to work, and what can we do to make it easier for you as the building inspector if there's a bylaw here. So lots of building inspectors very supportive of demolition delay bylaws once they once they understand the process uh, once it's all clear, uh, but definitely great to sit down with a building inspector well before you really get too far into demolition delay. A fact sheet, really good idea. Uh, just instead of having instead of just passing around the bylaw itself, have a fact sheet uh, that uh, just explains it just in a little more plainer language in terms of what the bylaw says, how it works why we need a demolition delay bylaw, uh, what the limitations of demolition delay bylaw, how it's just a window of opportunity, uh, have some success stories in there, other local towns with demolition delay. And that's what you're gonna use as your handout to meet with your select board or the building inspector, or when you hold your public meeting on demolition delay. Another thing with demolition delay uh, in terms of tips for passage is that it's usually general bylaw. So it's not usually zoning, and it's usually just a simple majority that you need that's needed at town meeting. So not the two thirds. The so downside of that, of course, is that it's a lot easier to rescind the demolition delay bylaw in the end because it can be rescinded with just a simple majority as well. Uh, but passage is usually just simple majority. All right. Um, incorporate demolition delay efforts into whatever your planning planning programs are. So if you have a historic preservation plan, we're gonna talk a little, I think we're going to spend just a minute talking about preservation planning summaries, uh, incorporating into there. Do you have an annual work program that you put together every year? Uh, if not, that's certainly a really good idea to have an annual work program uh, and incorporate some some demolition delay efforts into each one of those things. In the end, um, hey, it's important to just be patient and take care of yourself. Um, if you can't get demolition delay passed right now, just keep doing what you're doing. Can't do great things, do small things in a great way. Keep going, keep moving forward. All right, I'm gonna go through a few proactive tools and then we'll finish up here. <laughs> Important to remember that demolition delay is not actually a planning tool. It is a reaction tool. Historic preservation planning is essential to what you do as a local commission. So continuing on with that historic property survey that you're working on, <laughs> stick with that. That's a proactive tool. That's a planning strategy right there. Doing things like community engagement and appreciation, essential, an essential part of a local preservation program, stick with this. National Register, yes, keep doing things like National Register. <laughs> Whether it's expanding districts, new districts, National Register is a proactive planning tool. Highly recommend it. And keep the idea of local historic districts there as well. Uh, Hadley's got some such, such an amazing Hadley is just such an amazing place 
uh, that, yeah, it would be great to see things really well protected at some point in the future <clears throat> through a local historic district. Uh, so maybe someday. Um, but you can do local historic districts during the delay period of, of demolition delay, but that's far from ideal. A much wet, better way of doing local historic districts is to really have the time to really slowly, methodically think about uh, where where that local historic district is going to be, do all of the outreach and engagement, all the a, a slow methodical process. Um, so sometimes you could do a proactive tool just in terms of doing single building local historic districts. In a case like this, the property owner came forward and said, "Hey, can you?" A commission, can you establish a single building local historic district on my property? I'm going to be uh, moving downsizing sometime soon. I want to make sure this house that I've lived in for the past 50 years is well protected. Can you create a single building local historic district? And in this case, that's what happens. The, the town meeting approved a single building local historic district. So this was going to be well protected into the future. And that was so in this case, it was owner. The owner, this is what the owner really wanted. Uh, as a proactive tool. Same thing right here, this Wellesley Mass House, which might not look too significant, um, but it really does have some historic significance to it. This was uh, the home of Sylvia Plath. Uh, so a very significant property. Uh, so single building local, so single building local historic district established here. Somerville, uh, over 200 single building local historic districts in Somerville. <laughs> Yeah, lots of single building local historic districts in Somerville. That's a tool that they have really taken to the extreme there. Uh, zoning. Uh, important just to think about how how zoning, What's if we change our zoning, what's, what's that going to do? So here they changed the zoning uh, to allow some new uses on this property here. And that meant immediately that the building was threatened with demolition because it was it was going to have some new new potential uses there. It seemed kind of obvious. So zoning can be the help, the hindrance. You do all kinds of things with zoning in terms of historic resources. Uh, again, best to do that through some sort of master plan process or preservation plan process, some kind of planning process to recognize what uh, what your impacts of zoning are. Yep, to get what you zone for. All right, so I just took a few slides from my outreach outreach presentation, which is usually about 90 minutes. Uh, and just this is just one type of outreach, education and appreciation. I, I actually point out that there's lots of different types of outreach. Uh, but the one that I think that relates most to Hadley Historical Commission, education and appreciation. So really just that idea of slowly and deliberately increasing recognition in the community that this is a really amazing place that we live in. So examples of this kind of outreach, uh, things like historic plaque programs, where it's a really organized plaque program, uh, where all the plaques look the same, where you've actually got to apply for the plaque, uh, where there's a plaque that's actually based on some historic research ahead of time on say an inventory form, uh, that you have to meet some criteria. If your house is covered with vinyl siding, you're not eligible for a plaque. Mm. These things are wonderful, one, a wonderful tool uh, to really engage property owners, really, really help to recognize for property owners and really anyone driving by that this is a special place because they see all these these similar plaques through the whole through the whole area. Um, definitely a big fan of entering historic district signage, whether it's a or a national register district or a local historic district. These are these are great great things to really point out that this is a we're about to we're about, I'm about to drive into a really important place. Look at that sign. It says historic district. Local preservation award programs. Another great idea to just uh, really raise the interest that that uh, awareness and uh, get lots of good publicity for the commission and property owners that are doing the right thing. All kinds of possibilities in terms of events that you can do. Preservation month is during May. And so lots of commissions really take advantage of that in terms of doing 
special talks, walking tours, events, all kinds of all kinds of things during during the month of May. Uh, Lowell has an interesting one called Doors Open Lowell. Preservation Worcester does something similar, uh, where lots of buildings that are usually not open to the public for one day a year, they open them up and uh, there's a docent there and they get to, people get to go walk through maybe a hydroelectric plant or something like that. That's usually, that's usually closed off. All right, I have a one pager, which I'm going to send out. I'll send, plan on sending that out to you tomorrow. Uh, it's just a one pager of, of ideas uh, on, on uh, encouraging interest in historic preservation in terms of appreciation uh, community engagement, things like that. Uh, and it's, it's really meant to be, a, a, it's meant to be kind of an overwhelming list of possibilities in terms of, uh, community engagement ideas. Uh, the kind of list which you would look at and go, okay, which ones of these 50 plus lists, which, which three of these are going to be the best ones for our community? So I will send that out. I will plan on sending that out to Diana tomorrow. All right, and I'm going to finish up there. And I'm happy to happy to have more more questions sent my way too, though. It keeps running through my head that it would be a good idea to reach out to the house owners on all around the common to ask them if they would be interested in putting their individual houses into a private historic into a single house historic district, because many of them might want to see those houses preserved down the road as well. That might be a, a, an outreach that we could take advantage of. Yeah, I also really like that idea because I do think like the individual might be much more accessible than the town and it might be more likely to yeah. pass that way since mm -hmm. it wouldn't be affecting anybody else. Yeah, I mean, it, it, there's some downsides to doing it that way, especially when, it, where, when it's such an amazingly significant streetscape. <laughs> Having one property in, two properties out, mm -hmm. one property in, three properties out, things like that. It can, it it can have some problems later on, uh, down the road in terms of, in terms of new owners and bad feelings and things like that. With with uh, when things are scattered like that, um, so it, I, I would say the single building local historic districts are best when it's really standalone properties, uh, where there, there where there aren't a lot where there isn't much in terms of significance around it. But, it, you know, it's up to you. I mean, it's it's a uh, local historic districts. It, you, it, it's the the key word there is local, and you get to decide uh, where where local historic districts can be established through the local de democratic process. Um, it is up to you. I'm not sure on on the common if the work that's been done on some of these houses um, would qualify for it. You know, in the last, I mean, some of them are, um, you know, have had some re, uh, or renovations and um, they were built less than 100 years ago and they may not, you know, be uh, included in a single house yeah. historic designation. Otherwise, it's a great idea, but uh, you know they're not. These aren't the um, homes of. Um, it, it's not like Lexington and Concord here. <laughs> there are a lot of homes on the street that. You mean, you mean homes that came, homes that came much later? What's that? You, you mean homes on the on the common that came much later? Oh, much much later. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Well, I mean, and, you would and, find and you could you could owners, find that owners owners in the well. last couple of years who you know don't seem to care about the fact that their house has one of these plaques on it. Mm -hmm. So Irene, we would make the, um, the designations. So if we were to do the entire, let's say north end of the common, the houses that don't fall within our stipulations would be given um, dispensation for um, 
things like renovations and whatnot. Like I know there are a few houses that were built in like the 1950s or even later because other houses were moved or torn down or burned down. So it, it really comes down to the requirements that we make for our local store district while yeah. following the state regulations as well. Yeah. I'm also I'm excited to it. at all. I think that would be a good idea. It's just I think that's the reality of the inventory on this on this street. Yeah. And um because yeah, it's it is special. So there should be something done. I just, I, I, I don't know if it's a single property, you know, um, historic designation. Yeah, I am. I am excited about the, um, the outreach and engagement ideas though, Chris, that mm -hmm. all of those seemed really cool. I, I really liked the idea of a, uh, the historic plaque program. I think that's a really cool idea. Like having one that maybe people have to apply to through us, maybe that would get, People excited. I don't know if there's been anything like that done, Diana, in the past. Um, you would know better than I would. Um, and or also like a preservation award that we could give out potentially if somebody's done a really nice job with their preservation. Um, yeah, I think there's I think there's a couple of really solid ideas there that could get the owners of these homes excited more excited about what they have potentially than they already are. Yeah, we haven't done any kind of plaque program because we just don't have any funding. There was one so, long ago. It's just they need a serious upgrade. They're they're literally just a board that has the year. Yeah, it's like a tiny one that has the year. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that even that though I is like so one. cool driving by. I think it makes a difference. Even being able to see the year, you know, like I took my mother in law down that street. And she'd never been to New England before the first time she visited, and and she was really excited just to see the years on the houses and how long ago they were built because she's from California. Nothing's more than a hundred years right. old in California. Yeah, so yeah, I'd love to upgrade those. But yes, yeah, so they were really big. They were really big in the bicentennial <laughs> time. So a lot of the ones that you see on the houses actually date from 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 then. Yeah, um, yeah the, the ones that we the ones that the, the best the best programs that that exist nowadays. It's going to have a historic name. It's going to have the date, and then it's going to have the organization that's responsible for. Uh, for, for administering the program. So would, at the bottom, it would say Hadley Historical Commission. In in terms of funding a plaque program, I don't know how it actually gets started, I guess, and always, but um, usually they're, they're kind of, they kind of, they, they pay for themselves basically. So you're, 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 you're getting the plaques made, uh, but the property owners themselves actually pay the 90, 100 or whatever dollars for the plaque itself. And, for the most part, from what I hear, they're they're thrilled to get a plaque and they're very willing to pay that money to have a plaque placed on their house. That's very cool. I really like that idea because then if we advertised it quite a bit, I think a lot of these people who have those signs already might be excited to get a new one, especially if they were all going to be the same and it was like this special thing that you had to apply for. I don't know. People love like exclusives. <laughs> Anything that's exclusive is like very cool. So that, I, I think that's a great idea. I think that's an awesome I mean, I know we have like many projects going already, Diana, I, I was happy to hear when you touched on um, Chris, when you were touching on the other outreach and engagement programs, like the things that Diana and the rest of the commission has already been working on for a long time prior to me joining, but the walking tours, the brochures, the driving tours, there's a lot of things that are already in place that have been, they've been really hard at work about, but I, you know, so there's a lot going on, but I think adding maybe a few of these other things when we can is is i think that's an awesome awesome new stuff to potentially add to the program so we appreciate the ideas and i look forward to reading the rest of the list as well okay okay i think marketing is a great idea the all the ideas that you put forth of uh, what other towns are doing you, you know first you, you have to start getting the community engaged and talking about it and thinking about it and um that you know and, and um the commission has already been working for the last uh, x number of years on this you know the walking tour and the driving tour and just really wonderful i mean we're on the cusp of, of you know putting something out there that's really exciting and we'll get people talking so um i i just think i i you know i bought this house it's in 1896 it's got a date on the house but i wouldn't my house 
it's vinyl sided and I just replaced all the windows and did a mass save, you know, program. So it wouldn't qualify probably for one of these plaques. Yeah. And I don't know how many others on the street would when you really kind of get down into what the criteria is. But mm -hmm. I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to poo poo it. It's just, you know, there is a reality of, <laughs> you know. So no again, that's going to be a locally, locally decided criteria in terms of who's eligible for a plaque. So vinyl siding might not, you might decide vinyl siding is not an issue at all. I think we really want to be able to work with our public and we mm. don't want to make this a headache for them. We want to get them on board with it. So we, I think we would need to really take a deep look into things like that because we want things to be affordable. We don't want to tell people they have to get, they have to source historically um, period windows, for example, like that's not energy efficient. That's ultimately um, looks beautiful, but not a cost savings for them. And we want them to be on our team. So I think we just have a lot to think about in terms of what criteria we might come up with. And the messaging. Yep. 100%. Because yeah, this, is, this is this is a national treasure, I think. And you know, mm -hmm. we should be able to, we, we should at least try to do something. We just have to make sure we're meeting people where they are. Yeah, I think I think that's case in point of what we've seen so far in Hadley is meeting people where they are. And I think that's part of why the local historic district, right? I assume, Diana, that's why it was shot down so quickly is because people felt like it was going to encroach too much on maybe what they were capable of of funding or like things that they wanted to do with their personal property. So I think it's, um, yeah, it's definitely a matter of meeting the public where they're at. And, you know, Chris, um, there was... The, um, this was wonderful, and we're talking about demolition. Demolition, um, you know, was focused on that, and those are buildings. But what about um, you know historical uh, landscapes, and you know, preserving just the um, the landscapes? You know, this is a beautiful agricultural community. Agriculture is hot right now, and preserving and regenerative farming there's these things are all coming together and um you know we want to protect that too you know it doesn't necessarily have to be a building it's also the landscape the area yeah so tonight we just focused on demolition delay which is really just going to be on buildings uh landscape certainly a whole other a whole other topic entirely and the toolbox that you're going to use to protect historic landscape is going to be a whole lot different than what you would have just for buildings. So local historic districts, demolition delay, not not good tools at all for protecting uh, agricultural or historic landscapes. Um, but you've got other tools. I mean, you have CPA in, in Hadley, right? Yes. Right. That's, and we that's are the best the... available for open space. Yeah. We also are the community in Massachusetts that has the most land in APR. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Mm, didn't know that. Yeah, yeah we are. Great. Wow. A lot so, of land along the river. Mm -hmm. wow. uh, and so I think, you know, um, we're definitely in support of preserving our historic landscape, but I think there's also other uh, committees and commissions in town that also focus on that. Like we have an agricultural commission. We have... The cemetery commission that focuses on our historic cemeteries. We have our CPC committee, excuse me, CPA committee that focuses on that and having the funding to preserve the land. And we also have the conservation commission. So I think there's a lot of us that do focus on the importance of that. And recently it's become very clear that that is a priority for almost everyone in town and that we've been keeping businesses on Route 9 and preserving the land elsewhere. Yeah. And that that's a great message to get out there and put it together and, uh, um, you know, just toot your horn, toot our horn, of, you know, of what you guys have been doing and what we can help going forward uh, to, to get the word out and um, messaging. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's all good. It's all good. All right. Thank you so much, Chris. Does anybody have any final questions or thoughts? I just want to mention to you, Diana, that the 
Cemetery Commission is essentially defunct. Cemeteries are now under the mm -hmm. care of the DPW. Okay, so that has changed recently. Thank well, you. Well, we have that ugly fence now. In Hawkins. I guess. <laughs> I guess my um, my final question about this is, if we wanted to put together a preservation plan summary with you at some point, I, we had talked about potentially funding for that as well. And I I think the funding is limited for like an entire preservation plan to be put together because I know that's a, a really lengthy process and is fairly expensive. But in terms of a preservation plan summary that would kind of help us move forward and take the steps that we need to take, um, what's the kind of situation there? Okay, sure. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, preservation a preservation plan is usually a really comprehensive nine month long, year long look in terms of Everything related to historic preservation in the community goes into a lot of detail. Uh, those are usually going to be 30, 35, 40K and up. Pretty expensive, yeah. pretty expensive projects. Uh, obviously, they have some they have some wonderful, wonderful benefits to having that kind of depth to understanding the historic preservation program in your community. I think there's a little bit of a downside besides how expensive they are. I've just noticed over the years, there's some downsides to just having a preservation plan that's just 200 pages long and is a bit overwhelming for mm. a volunteer commission to think about. And so I've actually had local commissions that have done a, a, that have spent 35K on a preservation plan in the past couple of years and called me and said, we're not quite sure what we should be working on. I'm like, but 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 you just spent 35k on a, on a preservation plan and you know it's it's just too overwhelming it's too much there's too many recommendations it's too much it's too much to take on as, as a group of volunteers and so that's why i like this idea of a preservation planning summary which or uh i'm, I'm gonna so i mean i'm uh, for massachusetts right now i'm figuring like a 750 dollars project I come in and spend a day with you. Um, we tour around town. We talk about everything that's going on in the town of Hadley. We have a meeting. We do sort of a, a, a kind of a retreat, retreat or a brainstorming. We talk about our strengths, the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats related to uh, you as the Hadley Historical Commission in terms of historic resources in the town. And we talk a little bit about a little about about all of those things in terms of your where you're at with your historic property survey, where you're at with National Register, where you're at with um, demolition delay, or community outreach, or um, uh, working uh, working with your local elected officials, or how you function as a commission itself, because that can come up a lot in terms of just how you as a group of commission members. Uh, get things work 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 effectively together. So that administration aspect of the commission, we talk about that as well. And so it's really trying to think about uh, what what can I come up with for you in terms of an analysis and a set of recommendations based on uh, spending the whole day with you and an evening. And then putting together a, a, a much a, a briefer report, preservation planning summary, that gives you a good set of recommendations for where to go from here. And so that's really tailored to the Hadley Historical Commission, uh, and uh, gives you gives you a much a much a much more succinct idea of what of what you really need to focus on. So I haven't done any in Massachusetts yet. I've done a couple of them outside of Massachusetts. Uh, but you would be the first to do them in Massachusetts. I think it's a great idea. I'd like to see a lot more of these uh, done for Massachusetts because I think I think it's really it's it's really a valuable tool uh, and obviously much more affordable, cost effective than a than a preservation plan. Certainly, one of the recommendations in a preservation planning summary might be that you need a preservation plan. But that's that's uh, <laughs> that's just a, that's, that would just be one of the recommendations in there. So yeah, we could get into a lot more detail in terms of what would be good for you for outreach, a plaque program, something like that. Um, but it's really tailored the, for each. What have the results been so far, Chris, of the um, um, the summaries? 
Yeah, yeah, they're 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 definitely well received. Uh, I've done two in the last year, so I'm not sure in terms of what's actually been implemented so far, but they've been very well received uh, in the other in the other communities I've worked on. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, I think I think it's just it's 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 been they've been taken very well in terms of something that's very succinct for for what their what their needs are at that point. I think, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Diana, I think one of the biggest things that we would be looking for would be a succinct and easier way of sort of categorizing everything because we don't really have like a really comprehensive categoriz categorization system in Hadley of the historical buildings, like something like an online database or just like a way to organize this more palatably so that everyone can look at it and like know exactly what we're talking about in Hadley. So I feel like how to go about doing that and like how to go about listing or categorizing all the stuff that we have available to us um, is something that would be really important mm -hmm. in the plan. Is that in terms of increasing your, your historic property survey or is, is that really more publicizing? Just like, like organizing, like we have, I feel like bits and pieces, like there's some things over here, there's some things in the National Register, there's like a lot of, I know, paperwork at the Historical Society, like of these, you know, records of old buildings and things like that, but there's not really like this comprehensive database. And I don't know if you've seen towns that have done a comprehensive like online database that's available at Town Hall or something like that, or available through the commission. I don't know if, if you've seen like a really good way of cataloging all of these properties that works really well, but I know that that's been kind of an issue in past meetings is we just don't really have a system like that that works. And I know that actually formulating something like that would probably be fairly expensive to like hire someone to put it together or put together some kind of online catalog, but just like what we should be going about collecting to even make that happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can't remember which towns it is, but there are some towns that have done, done some interesting things in terms of, that community engagement aspect of having uh, historic material up on the up on their website about all the all the historic buildings in town and landscapes. Yeah, I think it'd be, it would be cool if someone could go on you know the town website and like click through the register of buildings, mm -hmm. or you know if owners had documentation or there was documentation just floating around. If if people contributed, like it might be a good way to get people involved too. I don't know. Um, but putting together some kind of comprehensive list would, would also just be really helpful for us, I think, too, and knowing more of what we were dealing with. Mm -hmm. Is there anything from the, um, um, the the walking and driving tour of Hadley, those properties that were identified? That's a start. And MACRIS is a start. Um, yeah. But we do often get requests from people like, oh, I would like a full comprehensive history of my house. And we're like, well, this is what I can find through some Google searches, really. But otherwise, like, I, I understand that we have a lot of records that live um, either at the town hall or perhaps in the Goodwin building at this point. But those have never been digitized. They're hard to access because you have to get special permission to go into the locked Goodwin building. So it's just not an ideal situation. I, From what I understand, I think this preservation plan summary would tell us like what we've done and what we need to do next, which I think is really helpful for us to um, like get all on the same page and determine how we um, are looking forward in the next 10, 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Do you ever meet in person? I mean, it'd be, it'd be great if we could just actually meet in person and do flip charts and just have lots of things up on the walls and we can make that happen. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. Zoom has yeah. just worked based on varying locations of us. So, uh, but if we're going to pick a day that we're going to do this day long retreat, then we can definitely make that happen in person. Cause I think that makes a lot of sense. I love the idea of driving around town together and um, really seeing what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Especially for us new members who don't know like the whole history of all of the things that maybe you guys know who lived in town forever too. It'd be really interesting to hear everybody's takes on the whole town and just kind of like, you know, cause we've all driven around, but I'm sure there are things that I don't know about that are probably really important. I'd love it. Yeah, it'd be great. I know we had talked about um, applying for CPA funding potentially at the next town meeting for this. So I think that's something that we're gonna work towards. 
Mm -hmm. So yeah, we'll be, we'll be in touch with you about that and about our future plans, but I think that would be great. If you guys are all in agreement with working on, on that. Yep. Sounds good. Well, we really appreciate you coming. I'm so glad I found you. <laughs> we were able to like make this happen because this, this was really helpful to us. And, mm -hmm. you know, thank you. Brianna, for doing yeah. This. Yeah. It was yeah. You were a great find. I was like, yes, we found someone who actually knows what he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> you can help us out here. <laughs> well, you're very kind. Thank you. Yeah. We appreciate it. Very helpful. Lots of information rolling around in my brain right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. Especially because we had three new members when yeah. I joined. It was all three of us. It was like a big changeover and a bunch of us have moved here fairly recently. And, you know, so it was really helpful. I, like there are people like Diana and, <laughs> and even Courtney who's new, but like you guys know so much. And of course, Sharon too. But the rest of us are like still trying to play catch up, I think, a little bit on everything. Yep. So, yeah, <laughs> this is really helpful. Good. That's great. Great. Well, I enjoyed being here. Well, thank you again. We have our regular business meeting next week where we will digest everything and talk about our next steps. Great. I'll, I'll get a PDF of this presentation out so you can. Perfect. You'll have that as well. Awesome. Right. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.